acceptance of them as well. In addition, um, I would note one thing that comes up all the time. It really doesn't make a lot of difference to me. My name is S-T-E-P-H-E-N. My mother might get upset if you spell it wrong, but I oftentimes will cross out the name if it's spelled wrong and just write my name in. Um, all, all I'm saying that to you is because it, it sometimes uh, doesn't look very professional where you get my name wrong. I, believe me, it doesn't bother me one bit, but I just uh, letting you know just for your own edification. At this time, I'll go back out and stop the hammering and uh, have uh, Guy Giancarlo uh, take it from here. It's a great pleasure to have Guy back. You remember he was with Judge Martocci. Uh, you'll know that he has two children. We've had a chance to hear all about his kids, and Guy's doing well, and, and uh, we're just happy to have him. Guy? Thanks, Judge Cass. First off, I would like to uh, thank the sponsors, the Jamestown Bar Association, Bar Association of Northern Chautauqua County and the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation, as well as the folks at Phillips Slide Lake Greg Peterson for pro pulling this all together. Uh, when I received the email from t my friend Tom White uh, letting me know that Judge Cass uh, had invited me to speak here today, how could I refuse? Um, first of all, with all due respect, to Judge Cass's father. To me, Judge Cass, Stephen Cass, is the real Judge Cass. It's the only Judge Cass I ever knew. Secondly, it would give me a chance to uh, get back down to Chautauqua County and interact with the members of the bar here, whom I enjoyed, quite frankly, working with so much as Judge Martoji's clerk back in 2001. In fact, one of my best life memories uh, harkens me back to those days in Chautauqua County. Uh, March 30th, 2001, was media day in the courts for the 8th Judicial District. I see Kathy Krause smiling back there. I know she paid, played an integral part in that. Well, March 30th, 2001 was also my wife's due date for our first child. And um, nevertheless, I headed down that day for media day. Well, punctuality being one of my wife's traits, I got word in the middle of media day panel session with all the big wigs down from Buffalo that I better hightail it back to Buffalo uh, and that night I became a father which was kind of nice but as a corollary I, I came back a couple days later and um, I was given a parenting book as a gift from this very able very gregarious young attorney named Greg Edwards now I don't see Greg here today could somebody tell me what happened to Greg <laughs> Well, as Judge Cass indicated, I am now Associate Counsel for the uh, 8th Judicial District Grievance Committee. Uh, in that regard, I thought I would spend some time discussing the grievance, the grievance committee structure and some of its procedures uh, regarding the grievance process. I do this because most attorneys who get a grievance filed against them um, have no idea about the process, and quite frankly, they're a bit apprehensive. I'm happy to say, though, that 95%, a full 95% of the complaints that our office received are dismissed without merit. The uh, rules relating to professional discipline in the fourth department are uh, set forth in tab, in tab five of your materials. I'm just going to highlight a few things. The, um, the fourth, at section 102.19, that's what's called the fourth judicial department grievance plan, which kind of lays out our procedures. Um, reading from it, uh, there shall be an attorney grievance committee for each ju judicial district in the fourth judicial department. The committee shall be composed of members recommended by the presidents of the local bar associations in each district, and there shall be at least one member from each county in each judicial district. Um, John Samuelson was a, a former member of the committee. Um, Sue Evans, her term just expired, and she's being replaced by Charlie Loveland. And uh, another committee member from Chautauqua County would be uh, Dale Robbins. So everyone knows to be nice to Dale and Charlie. Um, the, uh, 
there's a chair of the committee. The chair currently is an attorney named John Elmore. He practices out of Buffalo. Originally, he's, from, he's actually a Cat County guy out of Olean. Um, members of the committee, such as Charlie, are, are volunteers. Um, but then aside from the committee, there's the staff. I'm one of the staff. The, st the staff is engaged in the day-to-day -day activity of you know, going about the work of the committee. The, um, the staff is comprised of a chief attorney, currently it's David Edmonds, and, and staff attorneys like myself. And uh, we are appointed by the uh, presiding justice of the fourth judicial department, who would be Justice Piggott. Um, and then up beneath the attorneys, we have investigators and clerical staff who assist us. Now, once a complaint is filed in our office, which can be filed by a member of the public, we get them from judges, we get them from attorneys filing complaints against other attorneys. Um, we open up what's called a complaint file. And our first action is we, we take a copy of that, we take the complaint, photocopy it, and send it out to the, to the subject attorney for his or her comments. And they have 14 days to get back to us. Now, one thing on that note, the, the worst thing you can do if you ever get a complaint filed against you is to ignore us. It just boggles my mind when an attorney just doesn't respond to us. You know, most of you know me from my days down here as Judge Martocci's law clerk. I'm a very reasonable person. The other attorneys in the office are very reasonable people. We're always more than willing to give an extension. You know, we've been over backwards. So if, you, if, if there's any kind of a problem, just don't ignore it. Contact us. And, and, you know, we can, we can work something out as far as, you know, getting, giving you time if you need so to, to get in a response. But just don't ignore it. Um, then once we get uh, the attorney's response, we send it out to the original complainant to get their take on the, uh, the attorney's response. And then at that point, we, the investigation can branch out into a number of different areas. As I said earlier, 95% of the, uh, the complaints get dismissed. Uh, if we feel that further investigation is necessary after we receive those initial letters, um, you know, sometimes we'll request more materials from the attorney to um, substantiate his or her position. We do have subpoena power, which we exercise on occasion. Um, ultimately, though, we, invest, we uh, investigate the complaints to what we believe to be a reasonable degree, and at which time a... Um, a decision is made, is made as to where we want to go with this, with the complaint. Um, the authorized dispositions are set forth in uh, subsection 2. You can dismiss the complaint as unfounded by a letter to the complainant and subject attorney. And as I said, that's how 95% of the matters get resolved. Um, when it appears that there are, uh, that the attorney may have engaged in misconduct as, the, as a result of substance abuse. Um, we have a diversion program, which uh, I'll get into a little later, but that's another possible disposition. When it appears that the attorney has engaged in inappropriate behavior that does not constitute professional misconduct, we generally issue a letter of caution to the attorney, which, you know, lets the attorney know, hey, look, you better watch yourself. You know, what, what you're doing is really on the edge. Um, and if you, if you keep it up, you may find yourself in trouble. Um, if we determine, though, that the, um, either because of the history of the attorney with our office or because of the, the conduct itself, that uh, something more than a uh, letter of caution is warranted. And a letter of caution despite its name, is considered non-disciplinary. It's not considered discipline. Um, if a determination is made that something more than a letter of caution is warranted, the, uh, the staff attorney, myself, there's actually in, in the Buffalo office, there are three other attorneys and then one who works part-time, will prepare a report summarizing the findings of the investigation and prepare that report for consideration by the committee. The committee meets six times a year, um, and uh, we mail out the, uh, a copy of the report to the 
subject attorney as well as to the committee members um, and along with sending out the report we recommend either a what's known as a letter of admonition which is a private letter of this it is considered disciplinary in nature but it's private or we recommend that uh, formal proceedings against formal disciplinary proceedings be commenced against the attorney in the appellate division um, by the way the attorney certainly has the right to counsel uh, all throughout the process in any event um, once this report is sent out the committee at whenever the next meeting is scheduled will consider the report the the, uh, the attorney has a right to appear has a right to appear as I said with with an attorney and after uh, our presentation and the attorney's presentation um, the committee votes and will vote either a letter of admonition which is a um, well, first of all they could vote to dismiss it which doesn't usually occur but they can either vote for a private letter of admonition take up our, our recommendation in that regard or um, or if we recommend that formal proceedings be commenced against the attorney that the, the committee is still empowered to say hey we don't believe it's quite it quite rises to the level warranting uh, formal disciplinary charges being brought against the attorney nevertheless we think that a letter of admonition is warranted or the uh, the uh, committee can go along with the staff's recommendation and um, and authorize proceedings formal disciplinary proceedings before the appellate division okay if formal disciplinary proceedings are authorized um, the staff attorney drafts a petition it's served on the attorney and uh, the petition like any other pleading is either admitted or denied if it's admitted the matter is submitted to the appellate division to the five, to five justices up in Rochester who uh, who consider will consider the matter and issue some sort of discipline either they could disbar the attorney they could suspend the attorney they can issue a censure which is in effect a public letter of reprimand or occasionally they will dismiss the matter and send it back down to uh, be, to be dealt with at the committee level for either a letter of admonition or a letter of caution <coughs> If uh, the material allegations of the petition are denied, the fourth department will refer the matter to a to a JHO, which is usually a highly respected retired judge. There's a retirement plan for you. Um, and a, a trial is held before the JHO. Uh, the JHO, after the trial, ultimately issues findings of fact, which are sent to the appellate division for their consideration. And again, at that point. Based upon the uh, the JHO's findings, either a a disbarment, b a uh, suspension, c a, a censure, or again sending send it back down to the committee level. I want to go back to a little bit uh, something I mentioned earlier about the um, what's known as the diversion program, and that's a program um, available to to an attorney who is in the disciplinary process uh, where a um, where the alleged misconduct arose as the result of some sort of substance abuse um, it's a three-part test uh, regarding whether or not a uh, an attorney is eligible for um, placement in this diversion program and what the diversion program is in effect is the, the uh, investigation or the disciplinary proceeding gets put on hold the attorney is diverted over to a what's known as a lawyer's assistance program which is a, a program run by other attorneys to help get the attorney back on the right road vis-a-vis -vis his or her uh, substance abuse problem if the um, the three-part test is as follows the alleged misconduct occurred during a time period when the attorney suffered from alcohol or other substance abuse or dependency to the alleged misconduct is not such that disbarment from the practice of law would be an appropriate sanction that what they're saying is if it's the uh, if the conduct is so serious that it would warrant disbarment we're not going to let you into the diversion program and third the third prong which gives ultimate flexibility is diverting the attorney into a monitoring program is in the public interest um, if 
it's decided if, if our office decides that yes, you know this this attorney, um, the, the monitoring program would be appropriate. We we will draft a petition, bring it before the appellate division, saying, look, appellate division, we've we've got this investigation going on the attorney. Uh, this is what we've found so far. Uh, we believe that the um, the attorney the attorney is eligible for the diversion program based upon those three factors. Uh, please, attorney, uh, please, appellate division, grant an order placing the attorney in, into the diversion program. And if our office sees fit to, um, to in effect, go to bat for the attorney who's under investigation, I don't think there's been an instance yet, although the program's only been in effect since 2002, where the, uh, where the appellate division did not grant such an application of our office. Um, if the attorney is diverted, is placed in this diversion program, um, and after a year they abide by the rules, you know, attend their AA meetings, all their um, tests come back negative vis-a-vis -vis, uh, substance abuse, uh, we all go back to the court a year later, uh, report to the court what's gone on in the last year, and, you know, assuming everything's gone well, the court at that point will just dismiss everything, it gets sealed, and it's over and done with. It's a nice, you know, it's, I think it's a pretty fair way to, uh, to deal with things. I mean, you know, it gives an attorney a chance to, to really get his or her life back on track. I'm not going to um, go specifically into individual disciplinary rules other than to, again, reiterate what I said earlier about if you get a notice from our office, don't ignore it. Again, it's just the worst thing you can do. I would like, however, to go over the, uh, the structure, shall we say, of the uh, Lawyer's Code of Professional Responsibility, which is our kind of guidebook as to how um, it guides the staff and you know, how we go about conducting our investigations. I'm just going to read uh, from the preliminary statement, which really gives a, a, a great overview as to what it's all about vis-a-vis conduct as opposed to actual conduct as opposed to the procedure which I just went through. The Code of Professional Responsibility consists of three separate but interrelated parts, canons, ethical considerations, and disciplinary rules. The Code as a base is, is designed to be both an inspirational guide to the members of the profession and a basis for disciplinary action when the conduct of a lawyer falls below the required minimum standards stated in the disciplinary rules. Obviously, the canons, ethical considerations, and disciplinary rules cannot apply to non-lawyers. However, they do define the type of ethical conduct that the public has a right to expect, not only of lawyers, but, uh, but also those of their non-professional employees and associates in all matters pertaining to professional employment. A lawyer should ultimately be responsible for the conduct of the lawyer's employees and associates in the course of the professional representation of a client. The canons are statements of axiomatic norms, expressing in general terms the standards of professional conduct expected of, of lawyers in their relationships with the public, with the legal system, and with the legal profession. They embody the general concepts from which ethical considerations and the disciplinary rules are derived. The ethical considerations are aspirational in character and represent the objectives towards which every member of the profession should strive. They constitute a body of principles upon which the lawyer can rely for guidance in many specific situations. The disciplinary rules, unlike ethical considerations, are mandatory in nature, in, in character. The disciplinary rules state the minimum level of conduct below which no lawyer can fall without being subject to disciplinary action. The disciplinary rules should be uniformly applied to all lawyers regardless of the nature of their professional activities. The code makes no attempt to pres prescribe either disciplinary procedures or penalties for violation of a disciplinary rule, nor does it undertake to define standards of civility of lawyers for professional conduct. In that regard, a lot of the complaints which we get filed in our office really come down to, to civility. Um, but, you know, certainly being uncivil in the course of, of litigation is, is not actionable under the, the disciplinary rules. But let me tell you, take it from a former law clerk. 
judges take notice as to who's being civil and who's not being civil. I, I, I hope I'm not letting a chamber secret go, but I, I think that's pretty well pretty well known. Um, the severity of judgment against one found guilty of violating a disciplinary rule should be determined by the character of the offense and the attendant circumstances. An enforcing agency, such as the one for which I work, in applying the disciplinary rules may find interpretive guidance in the basic principles embodied in the canons and in the objectives reflected in the ethical considerations. No codification of the principles can expressly cover all situations that may arise. Accordingly, conduct that does not appear to violate the express terms of any disciplinary rule may nevertheless be found by an enforcing agency to be the subject of discipline on the basis of a general principle illustrated by a disciplinary rule or, the, or on the basis of an accepted common law principle applicable to lawyers. So that's pretty much, that is the substance, the substantive law that guides our, our office. Now lastly, and I guess I'm going to go a little short, but I don't think anyone's going to complain about that, given it's a Friday afternoon, um, as far as resources. There's a book we use in our office, we refer to it as the Bible. It's entitled Simon's New York Code of Professional Responsibility, An Responsibility Annotated. If there's one book you want to have in your, in your office, regarding ethics, it's this book. It is just an invaluable resource when it comes to um, doing research on, in professional discipline matters. It's, uh, it's the commentary by, by Judge Simons is just phenomenal along with the, um, the citations to the case, it lays out the disciplinary rules, cites cases to them, it's just, it's just fantastic. So. Um, I certainly have no monetary interest in, in the sale of this book, but it's, uh, it's a great resource. Now at this point, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions about the, the procedures of our office. I certainly can't get into um, talking about individual disciplinary rules. We're not allowed to give advisory opinions, and um, all our investigations are conducted in secret. So. <coughs> Um, you know, I'm kind of limited as to what I can talk about, but I certainly would be more than happy to talk about procedures. And if you were to ask a question, I would not read anything into it that you posed a question to me. So I open the floor. Marlene. The attorney, quite frankly, the way it comes, the attorney will talk about it with the chief counsel, who would be David Edmonds. The, the investigating attorney would discuss it with, along with the deputy chief counsel, Vince Sarcel. And, you know, actually, you know, we bounced it. We had a really nice staff that works well with one, with one another. We'll, we'll, you know, it's kind of a... Informally, we're going to, I mean, ultimately, it's the chief counsel's decision. He pays a lot of def, deference to the staff attorney. Um, and, and we also do seek the input of the chairman, quite frankly, also. So, not in this case, the chairman. We've had a chairwoman in the past. And then once, once we do present it to the committee, again, the committee's on their own. We're, we're just, you know, some liken it to a, to a grand jury proceeding. Certainly, there's nothing criminal in nature, about, and the, the standards of proof are different, but, um, well, actually, the standard, once you're before the committee regarding disciplinary uh, charges being filed with the appellate division is uh, it's incumbent upon our office to demonstrate to the committee probable cause that professional misconduct has been committed, serious professional conduct has been, mis has been committed. Um, and then uh, the committee votes, and it, it takes a majority of the of the committee members then present to uh, to authorize action, i.e., uh, taking it up to the appellate division. Yes. How many cases a year do you handle? 
we get about 800 complaints a year. Um, in 2005, I'm sorry, 2004, 2004, there were ultimately six formal disciplinary proceedings brought before the appellate division. Last year, 2005, it was up uh, maybe in the 10, 11 range. Um, this year, there's already been a few, but um, and the committee meets six times a year. I'm not sure if I, I brought that up already. Um, one other thing, actually, procedurally, if, if um, we are authorized, the, the chief counsel is authorized to bring what's known as a interim suspension motion against an attorney, that uh, in a, it can be uh, brought in the standard. We go right to the court. We bypass the committee. Uh, and if the chief counsel believes that there is um, uncontroverted, that is the standard, uncontroverted evidence of serious of a serious threat to the public um, if a particular attorney were to were to keep his license at that time the chief counsel is authorized to petition the court the appellate division for what's known as an interim suspension and um, the court either can deny deny the motion or or if they were to grant the motion then it's incumbent upon our office to get that investigation done expeditiously because again the, the the, the attorneys, you know, suspended um, to get to get our investigation completed, get it before the committee, and to get the committee to vote on it. To um, you know, usually in those cases, it's never a, a question that they're going to vote to authorize charges. But we want to get it back to the court as soon as possible. This is an interesting question. It came up in the judges' meeting. I'll ask the same thing to Guy. Did you keep a file on each attorney and? Are they entitled to see it? So let's suppose that claims are submitted and they're unfounded. Is uh, an attorney allowed to go look at their own file? Uh, if a if a claim certainly they they have um, if its claim is unfounded, the attorney will get a writing from our office that that the complaint was dismissed. The the attorney will get a copy in in, in at the beginning of the investigation of the complaint itself. Um, but as far as you know, anything beyond that, no, we, we it's con confidential. What's in our office stays in our office. Even, even the old attorney is not allowed to look at their file. We, no, we really, not that I, not that I'm aware of. We, it's, it's very, you know, we're very proprietary in that. Um, oh, not, in, uh, not ad infinitum. Um, I, I know that. You know when the um... oh no 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 Mr. Span no. no if it's no I'll tell you they do if it's if it ends up going to Rochester on a you know if it rises to that level then we keep it you know till they go but uh, <laughs> no we there I'm not sure I, I, you know we just moved offices from the the um, Ellicott Square building to the um, where the Erie County Bar Association is, their building at 438 Main Street, and I know we we sh we were the the uh, secretaries were lamenting that um, they had to catch up on their shredding, and I, I know at a minimum they were shredding things where complaints were unfounded, you know, well into the 90s. So I'm not sure of the exact number of years we keep it for, but um, it's it's not forever. Uh, well, I, I can't get into the specifics, specifics of anything in our office other than to point out that there is a, a disciplinary rule, and I can't set it off the top of my head, that, you know, does impugn on other attorneys the, um, the duty to report professional misconduct. I see no. On a serious vein, do you have some kind of estimate on the percentage of those who are brought before you who have violated the escrow 
I don't. I don't. Um, as far as that go up to that go up to. Well, again, as I said, we get about 800 complaints a year. Most of those involve civility; they end up going nowhere. Um, with regard to the percentage of cases that end up going, that end up where where formal charges are authorized, I, I'm not aware of the percentage. But nevertheless, certainly that is the most important and the, the most strictly construed. And, and you know, when we still see those trust account violations, look out. Okay. That's not to say that every minor trust account violation ends up in, you know, going before the court in Rochester. Mm. Far from it. But nevertheless, once it comes to our attention, we're going to look at it and we're going to look at it good. Anything else? Well, thank you all. Okay, if I could have you turn off the camera.